welcome to another edition of Harana. As usual, I have one of Gambia's greats that I'm uh, talking to today on this special edition of Harana. And uh, he's made it international in the film and cinematography world. And he's known beyond the borders of the Gambia and, of course, the United Kingdom where he is resident. He's no other person than Mr. Babu Sise. Babu, welcome to Harana. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you and to sit in the same space <laughs> with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're one of the people that we're very proud of, and uh, I'm glad you've accepted our invitation to be on this edition. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. It's my honor. Thank you. So with Harana, we're going to run first childhood. Did you grow up in Gambia, or where did you grow up? Uh, yeah, I was actually... The uh, first thing I'll say, actually, I am not resident in the UK. Oh, I thought you were. I'm resident here now. Oh, now. <laughs> <laughs> One year I've lived here now. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Um, I have to go to the UK for work, but okay. I'm very happy now to call Gambia home. It's just so much more peaceful, happy. We have the beach. So, yeah, it's positive. Um, right. But when I was, I was born in England, mm -hmm. uh, my parents were studying there. And I think when I was nine or ten months, mm -hmm. we moved back to the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And I spent six years here, Mrs. Ndaos. Mm -hmm. Marina School eventually. Mm -hmm. I think this was very early days when Marina had first opened up. In Banjul? Um, or I think, I think I was one of the people that started in Banjul and then moved to Fajara. To Fajara, okay. Yeah. Or maybe it was when they moved to Fajara that my parents took me there. Okay. Yeah. And, um, but about the age of six, mm -hmm. my father got a job at ECOWAS mm -hmm. in um, the fund, which is in Togo, not the ECOWAS main unit, which is in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Togo. Mm -hmm. And so your early days, you must be speaking French and uh, oui, those local sure. dialects. <laughs> yes, Amazing. I do speak a bit of French. Look, it's been, a many, it's been many years, so it's not what it used to be. Yes. But obviously, all of us living in a French-speaking country, we learned, yeah, all of us, actually. My mom, who, you know, I don't think she spoke a word of French before we moved to Togo. Togo, and she speaks not only French, but even understands some of the local dialect there. How long have you been in Togo? We were there for... Total from 84, wow, 17 years. Mm -hmm. We're there for 17 years, I think. Okay. Have I got that wrong? I think I spent 11 years total in Togo oh. because I got to the age of 18 and then had to go elsewhere. But in, in the middle of that, Togo had a war. Okay. Nyasingbe Adem had a former president there. Mm -hmm. So um, people were trying to topple him. And we stayed for a year of that, but it got very, very violent. And at that point, we thought, well... You know, maybe it's time to leave. We came back here to Gambia in '93, mm -hmm. and we're here for two years. <laughs> so, uh, and then something happened something in Gambia happened in '94. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And in '95, things calmed down in Togo, so I went back there to do my A levels. Okay. Yeah. Your A levels was in French. Uh, no, we you went, went to an international school. I went to an international school, a British international school. Um, yeah, I. It's called the British School of Lome, but if you really think about it, we had about 55 nationalities there. Mm -hmm. So it was just across the board mm -hmm. from everywhere. Um, we had Tanzanians, people from Canada, India, wherever. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very good school. Very, very good school. I think that's where I developed my desire to act. Exactly. What were your memories of childhood between Gambia and uh, Togo? Wow. That the fun memories, the games, the friendships, the things that you had done that you look back and said, well, I had a really joyful childhood. Truly joyful, actually. It's, um, ah, you're going to make me cry because some of these memories are so special to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of Ibo Town. Mm -hmm. I used to go visit my dad's older sister in Ibo Town, mm -hmm. my Bajan Horaja. Mm -hmm. Sadly, she has passed away now, and her sons are scattered, you know, we're all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. But just going there, playing football, going down to the mangroves, hanging out with a group of people that, you know, are family, and you enjoy the time with them, that was very special. And the other side of my family, my mom's side, was in Banjo, Peel Street. Mm -hmm. So we used to go down to Peel Street, run around private rankings, all of those places, you know. Um, I just remember... It's part of why I've moved back to Gambia for my children mm -hmm. because I'm married to a British woman, so mm -hmm. we have mixed race kids. Um, and you know, the belief is that life in England is probably the best, but mm -hmm. I don't agree. 
and especially when it comes to childhood, I can see England for opportunity, but I don't really see it as a place to give children the freedom that we had here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love school, I guess. I was good in class. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to try as hard, so I get E for effort mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. C for effort. Mm -hmm. But I would get A grades, mm -hmm. B grades, um, mainly A grades, to be honest. I'm trying to pull back, but it's, that's the truth. Um, I enjoyed math, science, um, swimming. Mm -hmm. I really liked swimming after a while, playing tennis. And I, I guess we had adventure. If you imagine mm -hmm. at the age of six, we stayed in this hotel for three months when we were in Togo finding a place. Mm -hmm. I still remember that hotel. I still remember the first day we got there, mm -hmm. um, ordering food from a telephone. That was a yeah. big thing for me. In French? Um, no, I busted my best <laughs> English with them. Um, I didn't speak any, uh, or I, maybe I told my dad what, what I wanted. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite w really wonderful memories. And growing up in Togo, I guess it was more quiet. We didn't really have that Gambian community. There was mm -hmm. only a few Gambian families there. So we had a wider community. But mm -hmm. I was, um, it was fun. It was very... It was. Yeah, it was fun. It was a very positive time. And, you know, that's the last time that I was, if you really think about it, in the same house with my oldest sister, my little sister, my little brother, our Fatu and Tijan, all of us there. My older half-brother, Musa, was there with us as well for a while. So, yeah, so those are very fond memories. Very fond <laughs> memories. Yeah. Think about it now that you had gone to a school with children from 55 different countries, yes, so to speak, 55 different nationalities. Was that the first time that you had related with so many people from so diverse backgrounds, colors, religion, tribes, and all of that? Would you say that was the beginning for you to be able to gel with the world, so to speak? That's, so, that's, a, that's actually the, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because Marina had is an international school. Absolutely. But it, wa it wasn't at the level the British school was at in terms of the number of nationalities. Mm. Um, and also people with different backgrounds, different interests. Um, some of my closest friends uh, were from, I think my closest friends were from Nigeria, mm -hmm. India. Um, I had a Greek guy who was yeah. one of my friends. Uh, a Lebanese guy, Francis Azar. Mm -hmm. um, wow, Richard Basuna, also Lebanese. Um, there were some Gambians there, Modu, Moduka, Aliuka. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we had this nice... I think it did open my mind to the world. I've been very lucky. I've mm -hmm. managed to travel all over the place. I've been as far as Mexico. I've been as far as Japan. Um, both on work, doing... Um, productions but theater productions so and wherever whenever I go to these places I never feel first of all I like the adventure seeing the new place mm -hmm. but I never feel like they're any less or more human than me yes. you know what I mean and I'm sure that that British school of Lome had a massive part to play in that I mean look it's an infamous school the guy who tried to blow up the plane on New Year's Eve over uh, Chicago or Detroit mm -hmm. can't remember which of those two places is also from the British the school, school of Lome yeah. right so, you know, it was, but then apparently he got radicalized in the UK at LSE. Mm -hmm. um, but the British school really had something, something special. Something special. We'll take our first break here with Babu Sisei. When we come back, we'll talk about his acting and what got him into the big pictures. And, uh, of course, we'll talk about coming back home to the Gambia in the last segment of this edition of Harona. Stay with us. The audacity that we have as women today to, to impact our life is because of the childhood that we had growing up. So that has really conditioned me uh, to be the woman I am today, uh, to be able to uplift myself and uh, to uplift so many women. And I knew um, as a woman, education, I've always thought that way, was gonna be my way out mm -hmm. because I knew I couldn't rely on anybody, but if, I, if I'm educated, I will be able to, you know, impact my life and so many other people's lives. In terms of what I wanted to be, to, have a, to be a woman who had a voice. And when I looked around, not a lot of women had a voice. 
So we had to build um, within ourselves heroes inside of us to, 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 to create that voice inside of us. Welcome to Harona with my guest Babu Sise, an international actor from The Gambia. Mr. Sise, let's talk about acting. This is, for me, going to high school and being uh, at St. Augustine's, of course, the Gambia's oh, best. Marina great. is not the Gambia's best. St. Augustine, I, even I accept that. You accept, good, good. <laughs> At least we'll agree on that. I, like, I wanted to go to St. Augustine's. So, doing drama and acting roles, being a different person at different times, different seasons, what got you into that? I mean, it's yeah. not, it's not uh, a common trait for a Gambian. We all want to be engineers, yeah. doctors, lawyers, yeah. those things. That's what Accountants. Gambians like. <laughs> Accountants, yeah. yes. So why acting? Um, look, I was on the path to becoming a doctor, just mm. like everybody else. But deep down inside, I think I would have done myself a disservice. I might have struggled at one point to understand what life was about if I had gone on to be a doctor. Maybe I would have been rewarded mm -hmm. in terms of being able to help people. It's something I really love doing even today. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of for me personally, I love the sciences. I excelled at them and it seemed like the right path. Then at one point um, when I got to the UK, some um, small technicality about the fact that I hadn't lived in the UK mm -hmm. outside of full-time education for three years mm -hmm. meant that we as the assumption that both myself, my parents made, we all thought, and the British School of Lome, that I would get home fees mm -hmm. was quashed. So we went from expecting a small £1,000 per annum to, to 18000 No, 18. Eight? The medicine was 18. Whoa. So even my dad was like, look, <laughs> with all due respect, <laughs> this, uh, I'm going to need some time to build up to that. So I took my first year as a gap year there. And then I, in that year, I realized medicine wasn't actually for me. I started pulling back. So I went for microbiology. That then led me down the path of accounting. But before I went to uni, the person who'd been my mentor a, in uh, BSL, Mr. Mm -hmm. Kevin Glass, man from Newcastle, he came to BSL and started theater, really. He's the one who really picked it up. Mm -hmm. And he had a thing where he was just, he believed in me. And I remember age 16, him putting his hand on my shoulder and saying, look me dead in the eye, saying, you should really consider this as a career. And I was like, <laughs> don't yeah, be what are you talking what about? You my dad's not going to talk about rubbish. I just dismissed it. Yeah. But it stayed hooked. And you know, you look back, at that time, even when I was 18, about to go to uni, I called him. He reminded me, I'd forgotten that phone conversation. He reminded me, he said, no, 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 no. You called me before you went to uni to say to me, should I go to uni or should I follow my dream as an actor? And he said, at the time, I said to you, follow your heart, but you ended up still going to university. <laughs> well, you know, I think I have no regrets going to uni. Anyway, I then, um, but, you know, the interesting thing is in that period. It's if you go back, my Auntie Jamie here, mm -hmm. I, you know, you come to the country in sometimes. In Town? Oh, no, this That's is it. Auntie Holly. This is my Auntie Jamie on my mom's side. Okay. Yemen Jai. Um, and I went to see her, mm -hmm. um, and she told me straight away uh, that since I was four or five, she could tell that that was my interest. She said she's not surprised mm -hmm. that this is the way I've gone now. It's the way she said it to me that made me really think back. I loved movies. Mm -hmm. I would sit right by the TV like this. If you make one sound, shh. I don't want to miss a word. Even today, I rewind. Was that the Indian movies or was this the oh, cowboy movies? I loved cowboys. Mm -hmm. I loved it. But Indian movies, I loved. Sole? Sole? Dancer? You're hitting me now. Gabasin. <laughs> Gabasin. I'm in town. That's it. I mean, Tab is the Pre reason Pre I became Chabra. an actor. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Those That's are the generation, people. man. We had the video, videos of um, uh, all of these Indian films that my parents had recorded. This so I watched I Sole. Yeah. And Disco Dancer, Disco dancer yeah. uh, Sadram, Sudram, I don't remember the third word, yeah. just on repeat. Trishul, on repeat. Mm -hmm. Just watch it over and over again. But of course, I also watch, you know, Wizard of Oz and Sound of Music. Mm -hmm. I also watch Rocky and Ramble. Yes. You know, Sylvester Stallone were a big That's deal. a generation, man. Exactly. Terminators came later, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, those were the ones that really started me off. And um, interestingly, I think it's when I watched, my mom had the Motown 25 award ceremony mm -hmm. 
And when I watched that, I think something happened. I thought, oh, wait, this could be a real career. You can get to the point where you're being celebrated for it. It's not just a silly thing you do. It mm. could be as meaningful as sort of being a doctor. But, you know, all those things are just sinking into my subconscious. Um, it's luck, really. Little tiny things. My parents recorded videos. Togo was so dull over the weekend. If we didn't go to the beach, we had nothing to do. We didn't have many friends except for at school. Mm -hmm. um, and they're with their families over the weekend. And we watched movies continuously. Mm -hmm. So all those things really got me obsessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, but uh, looking back now, you think there are so many things that inspire us. Yeah. And sometimes we're not even aware. We don't see them at the time. That's it. But we'll look back, and then you realize, I was born to do this. I, <laughs> this, this was always in me. I just realized yeah. that now. Let me not this. It, <laughs> it was always there. It was always there. I, this feeling of being born to do it, definitely now, I'm, I passed the page, age of 40, I've started to really believe it. Like there are times when I'm stood there where I, don't believe, I can't believe that I'm an actual actor. And that I'm able to keep doing it and survive and feed a family. That I'm able to do those things. I mean, don't get me wrong. There were moments when I couldn't. It was very difficult. But the reality is that it has been, it's been quite the journey. I can't imagine what my life would be. If I, and, you know, it was just a momentary decision. I, I, I've told this story many times. But one of my cousins here came to visit Gambia visited my mom, said, can you give me Babu's number? Mm -hmm. He came back to England, he called me. I was working for Deloitte. I was at Hounslow Borough Council, at my desk, the phone rings. Mm -hmm. Answer is my cousin. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, oh, uh, I hadn't heard from him probably 10 years, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And I came outside to speak to him. And um, while I was stood out there, he said he's a director. And I thought, you know, company director. I said, oh, well done. Wow, he's an older cousin. And he said, no, 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 I direct plays. I direct theater. And I just couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. This person, you know, one of my saucer saucer cousins. And I thought, mm -hmm. how, how is this person doing that? So I said, look, um, what? I've always wanted to be an actor. I've always wanted to go to drama school. He said, oh, my girlfriend's sister. You know, it's Gabby Saucer's son. Mm -hmm. He said, my uh, girlfriend's sister uh, is an actress. And he texted me her number straight away. I called her while I was still sitting in the same place. She mentioned the Dance and Drama Awards because I just started my career. I was thinking, how will I afford it? And uh, that's it. I went and um, sat down and applied that day. And the rest, they say, is history. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll take our second break here. When we come back, the final segment of this Herona edition with Babu Sise, and uh, we'll exploit international stardom. How do you remain humble with all the success? We'll be right back not okay. It's not okay to ever be violated, to be abused, either verbally, emotionally, or just being raped, or whatever it is, physically. It's not okay, and you should speak about it. Welcome back to Harana. This is the final segment with uh, Babu Sise. Uh, usually, the last segment, we talk about current day Gambia. Yeah. But in your case, you have just returned. So we'll right. talk about your returning, but we don't, we're not going to muscle you into politics. Yes. So, so let's, let's go. When, once you get to the big stage, mm -hmm. there's a moment when you just pinch yourself and say, Babu Sise from Gambia, <laughs> me, boy from Lome, Indeed. all of that. How do I just get to this big stage? And is this real? Yeah. When was that moment for you? The first time you realized, oh, God, I've made it. I've crossed wow. the line now. Well, I, when I got nominated for a BAFTA. That was a good moment for you. That was a surprising moment. I mean, it was a whole congregation of things that happened. Um, I had done Gorilla, mm -hmm. and it was trailing. They mm -hmm. were showing it on YouTube, the trailer. Mm -hmm. Um, I was the lead in it, alongside Frida Pinto mm -hmm. and Idris Elba, which was big for me, mm -hmm. and John Ridley directing. He, he's, I'm a, he's a big hero of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd actually flown to L.A., mm -hmm. and I'd been to L.A. several times, two meetings the first time, mm -hmm. two meetings the second time, zero the third time. And on this trip, I'd had a new agent already in the U.K., and I had... You know, about no agent in the U.S. you meant? Or no, in the, the U.K. UK to export, yeah. And I was going to the U.S. 
to secure an age, a new agent or manager. Mm -hmm. And I had 19 meetings. Wow. So that was quite something mm -hmm. for me. And um, I had arrived, I checked into my place, I got an Airbnb. You know, um, instead of a hotel, I prefer somewhere that feels like home, I can cook. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'd, I spoke to my family, my mom and dad were in the UK, hung up the phone. And as I was about to fall asleep, the phone lit up. And you know, family man, when you're awake, the phone lights up, even if it's silent, you react. Mm -hmm. And I looked and it was a tweet from BAFTA saying I'd been nominated for the lead role. Mm -hmm. That was overwhelming in a way. Mm -hmm. And so I called my family and they screamed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody was just so happy, which was amazing. My parents prayed for me. I think it was the next day, but it was a combination of things. There was also an element of grief. Mm -hmm. It surprised me. I felt quite in shock almost mm -hmm. because you're used to striving. You're not used to arriving anywhere. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it felt like, okay, that's happened. But it was the combination of being in Los Angeles, knowing I had that run of meetings coming up, knowing that um, I was a lead in this show. There were literally billboards, mm -hmm. you know, and um, being nominated for a BAFTA. I felt a sense of real, real calm. And you didn't see it peace. coming, not that moment. That's the thing. As a kid, this is something I've noticed about myself. So when we're preparing to come to Gambia, say, from Togo, my siblings are excited from one week before. They're packing, they're doing everything. Me, I, I, I can't think of it. I'm very much in the moment. Mm. It's only on the day when we're in the plane. That you realize. And it starts moving. I say, ooh, we're going on holiday. Yes. So I've always been like that. So things surprise me. They catch up with me. I'm, I'm more interested in the work, the effort yes. that it takes. And yeah. then it pays off. Yeah. But then uh, quickly, now that we have just about four or five minutes to end this interview, um, how do you remain humble? Because for a lot of people, mm -hmm. success itself gets into the head. Yeah. And once it leaves in the head, yeah. you tend to feel godlike, yeah. so to speak. And, yeah. and humility disappears for some God. reason. Yes. Yeah. Um, my industry humbles you daily. Rejection is the norm. So I get rejected plenty of times. Um, and I think that keeps you grounded. But not only that, I have a deep faith in the road. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of, and I've had massive failures. Financial ruin, mm -hmm. made poor choices, uh, misspent opportunities, you name them. Mm -hmm. So I never ever think I'm godlike. I know I'm not infallible, you know. Um, my children keep me humble. And I care about the world, so when I see, sometimes when I'm pinching myself with some of the luck I have, mm -hmm. the guilt, I actually suffer from a form of success guilt where I feel bad for how things are going for me when they're going good. So I'm, I'm never able to, in fact, recently I'm trying to set up this business um, for the whole continent, um, for, for the acting industry. Mm -hmm. And the guy I've been working with for almost two months finally Googled and called me up and said, look, you need to say all of this stuff in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because now that I know this stuff about you, I would have planned my strategy differently. We don't need to do all of this. Mm -hmm. We don't need to deal with these people. We can start here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, well, he said, I'm shocked that you haven't told me this. And I said, I don't know. It's just not my style. So come on, in Gambia, you know what we're like as a people. Yeah, yeah. Nobu. <laughs> you want to go, mm -hmm. you don't want too many Sutra people to. That, Sutra, yeah. you don't want too many people to. And also, I don't know. It could all end tomorrow. You know, it could. That's the reality. For me, it's just the fun of the journey. Let's give you the opportunity to address young people yeah. who were your age, in your Togo days, in your London days, in yeah. your Banjul, Ibo town days, and are thinking, I don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be an accountant. Yeah. I don't want to go to the moon. Yeah. I want to be playing all of those in real life in movie roles Perfect. why do i specialize to do one thing when i can do all the things <laughs> exactly in the movie be a doctor be an accountant yeah depending on the role you play what do you say to such young people around the country from Carton to Kwaina, and they just don't see themselves yet in yeah. that role yeah i think i'll say three things number one um Really learn to listen to that gut voice. It's Allah, it's God talking to you. 
you've got to listen to it very carefully. I think that's one. That's important because it's not a bed of roses. The journey is hard. So if you're not in tune with that gut voice, you will not last the journey. There's no way. Once you hear it and the calling is there, that I want to go and do this with my life, you will meet resistance from parents, from other actors competing with you, from your health, from your family, you name it, it will come up. Financial challenges, because it's not every day you earn. All of those things are there, right? So to overcome that, be clear on your goals. Have your 10-year goal. Have your, and remember, you're going to do more in 10 years than you think you can. But you will do less in one year than you think you can. So focus on those goals and be, be specific. You know, I wrote down how much I wanted to earn. Mm -hmm. And I worked towards it. Per hour, per day, per week, per, 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 per annum. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, in this year, this 12-month period, right up to the 31st of, of December, December, midnight, in this coming year, I want to make this much. And then I committed to it 100%. Did you make it? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. I did. And I couldn't believe it. You know, it gives you a sense of, like, okay. So that's why I'm giving that one, to say, Actually, do not be afraid to set goals, even when you don't know what's ahead of you. You set it anyway. And the point is, I set other goals that I didn't achieve. But at least I was journeying. And I might achieve those goals four or five years down the line. But the third thing is, don't wait for anyone. Part of, our, part of the challenge is to assume there's no industry in Gambia. Yet there was no industry in Hollywood. You know, planes weren't flying. This camera that's filming me wasn't here. So on some level, try to figure out how you can overcome those things. Mm -hmm. it, and not just in Gambia, internationally. I could, look, if I was to really say, I mean, one of the things I want to do is do professional development here. <clears throat> so when I'm set up at that point, please come to me. Mm -hmm. And we will talk about it so I can say, okay, here are the steps you can take. Because there are specific steps you can take. Um, those are the three things that I would say to the youth in the Gambia. I want you to be fearless. Go madly in. It's one life. What, what else are you going to do with it? <laughs> you would rather be an unhappy doctor or a poor actor. Yes. But happy. <laughs> either, either, either way. Coming back home, how does it feel? Wonderful. It feels wonderful. I have found, refound myself. Um, it's actually since coming back, knock on wood, my career has actually improved in the UK, which when I was coming, I didn't expect that. I thought it would go down. But the complete opposite has happened. Because now when I interview or when, I, when I'm or auditioning for work or when I'm talking, I'm authentic. I'm no longer pretending to be a British man, an Englishman. <laughs> I'm Gambian. I'm Fana Fana. <laughs> you know. yeah. Feels good. Let's give you the opportunity to give a minute of last statements you want to do to the audience, to the people, influence yeah. our young people, uh, give hope to someone somewhere watching, listening to this. Absolutely. Um, it is possible. You can make it happen. One powerful thing is to try to divide up your reality from what you have in your heart. So I looked at myself at times, and my reality was that I didn't have any bread to eat. So it was, you know, one chocolate bar in a 24-hour period to try to survive. But when I closed my eyes, I imagined the beautiful life that I want to live. Mm -hmm. And I put that belief and faith out there that somehow, with other people's help, with Allah's help, with the world, it can in some way happen. And then I listen out to see what's coming. So for all the youth out there, it's possible. I think the future for Gambia is actually bright. I know a lot of people are feeling a bit pressurized by what the situation is. But I'm not political. There's no part of me that thinks we have to depend on a group of people or this institution of government in order to get anything to happen. I think there's 2 million of us, 2.4 now, between us, we can make it happen. I'm home. That's why I'm home. So exactly. Hopefully it's bright. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.